Hi everyone, welcome to the Q&A webinar for the online paracycling. My name is Peter Park. I'm the paralyzed I'm the cycling manager for Paralyzed Veterans of America. We have with us Frank Cundiff and Kyle Pittman. And let me introduce you a little bit about our panelists. Frank Cundiff is a director and operation of Echelon Project and a Navy veteran, and also has been an elite level bicycle racer. And currently he is racing for the Project Echelon. And also we have Kyle Pittman, who is the member of US Paralympic Cycling National Team. He rides for the C5 classification categories, and he's also a Marine veteran. And we have here now just joined Eric Hill. He is the one in charge of the Project Echelon. And he's also a veteran and also an elite level bicycle racer. And I'm going to correct you, Peter. I am not a veteran, but I love him to death. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry about that. Oh, you're good. So we have a few questions that we I collected from our participants. So let me just read out the question one by one, and you guys could answer them as best as you can for these guys. Just mind that these some of our guys are very new. So if you can use a little bit easier language than bicycle language, that will help a lot. So first question we have is, what is FTP and why does it matter? And how can I find my FTP? And what is the difference? Is there a difference between a hand cyclist compared to a foot pedal cyclist? So I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, your, your FTP, your functional threshold power is um, the maximal power you can output for one hour uh, in a nutshell. Um, the way you find it is you go out and pedal as hard as you can for one hour. Um, <laughs> there's, there's other ways to do that. Uh, the purists like to do the one hour. Um, it's miserable. I've done it before. Don't recommend it. Uh, the, the best way to go about it is doing a 20 minute power test and taking 95% of that number. It matters because that is how you build your power zones, uh, typically zone one through zone five or zone one through zone six. Um, and uh, that's, that's for your training, um, endurance, tempo. You'll, you'll see those numbers threshold, uh, all those terms thrown around. Um, and that's how you build a training plan is utilizing those train, those power zones you pull from your FTP test. Um, there is, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there is any difference between, a, a bike racer, uh, regardless of what, what machine you're, you're pedaling and, and how you're pedaling it. It's, it's math and formulas and numbers that's it right now the expected ftp of what somebody based on their different disability category would be is obviously going to change and the power output that you can do on a upright bicycle versus a recumbent versus obviously a hand cycle for certain is going to be is going to be different as well but the number and what it means and how do you, how you utilize it to create the categories should not change. Um, and what's really powerful is if you can, and this is going to get a little nerdy, so I'll back off after this, but if you can take your functional threshold power data information, and if you have access to tests like blood lactate testing and VO2 max testing, then you can get a comprehensive data set of your physiology and um, really, you know, what your performance expectations should be, where your ceiling is, and how you can, you know, step by step incrementally build up to your maximum capacity as an athlete. So, do you need to have an FTP as a recreational cyclist who's just doing your training? No, not really. Um, it's a, it's a data it's a data nerd thing in my opinion um if you are serious about your training and and you want something to measure to beyond just uh competitive racing or or just competition um 
you know, it's a, it's a good number to have just again, to set goals around if, if that's what you want to go about. You can also do it with, um, heart rate also, uh, if you don't have a power meter. And then I'd, I'd also add, um, just a, a personal recommendation, never compare your threshold power to somebody else's, um, power meters all measure differently. Uh, they have their own accuracies. Um, people are different just cause your one hour FTP might be, you know, a hundred Watts off someone else's doesn't mean you're, you're not stronger in other areas. And, and it can typically just, um, it's not a, not an equal comparison and can just drive you insane. <laughs> okay. Kyle, do you want to explain a little bit why FTP is just a number as well? And it doesn't dictate what you're capable of doing as a racer the difference between like actual racing outcomes and FTP. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good, it, it's a good point, Eric. Um, so, so part of the, uh, the nuance I think that uh, Frank and Eric are talking about is that um, because of pack dynamics, because of drafting, because of different terrain, and particularly because of power versus weight um, ratio. So if you're thinking, you know, let's say that um, uh taking out of the consideration in the calculus, uh, all the power mirror stuff, let's say Frank and I have the same FTP, but I am 50 pounds heavier than Frank. Um, if we go uphill, Frank is gonna absolutely destroy me, right? So that's one thing. Also, just because you can go a certain wattage for an hour, uh, Frank might have a much better ability to put a peak power than I might um, for 10 or 15 seconds, right? So there's a lot of different dynamics there, I would also sort of compare it to maybe it's like your time run back in the military, right? Whether you're doing a mile and a half or a three mile run or whatever, it just sort of gives you this idea of how you stack up and maybe how you perform against yourself last year or, you know, six months previous. So it's a good kind of uh, measuring stick to understand uh, where you are and uh, some big perspective and blocks about how you can get better. Okay. So, so answer is, you don't have to have it if you're a recreational rider, but it's good to have it if you're serious about it and want to learn about your data and want to improve. I learned something new today, so. All right, second question I have is, what should I drink and eat before and after my workout? Uh, Maybe I can... I, oh, go uh, yeah, go ahead, Kyle. Oh. Oh. I, I can start. I think it varies a lot depending on dietary nutrition uh, needs and the the length of the event and you know what you're trying to do. Um, you know, making sure uh, you're not starting in calorie deficit, right, is one thing, right, uh, and then staying on top of your nutrition during the race, especially for longer races over an hour, right. And then um, there's something called this glycogen glycogen window, uh, 20 minutes to a half an hour after you finish your workout that's really important that you refuel uh, the sort of proper amounts of fat, protein, and sugar and carbohydrates, kind of uh, the, the right mix there. Um, so that's kind of a really high overview. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're racing really hard, you need something, especially as a paracyclist, you can actually uh, reach or get into, right? So if you have limitations, you know, I've, I've got a bunch of teammates that um, they have to use camelbacks because uh, you know, they're using their hands all the time, right? Uh, uh, on, um, on hand bikes, or, um, I've got teammates missing arms, right? Uh, and so they have to sit up <clears throat> and pretty much pedal with no arms, no hands and, and take in fuel, right? So, um, it's, uh, planning out, uh, the types of things and then how are you going to intake them? So is it easier to, uh, you know, eat a sandwich or take a gel or a bar, right? Um, something you should also probably consider is, um, there's, there's a lot of op options that you can get calories, uh, with your drink, right. Whether that's in your bottle or on the camelback. So I'll start there, uh, Frank or Eric. Yeah. Um, I, I think like you said, it's, it's largely based on dietary, um, restrictions. You know, we've got guys on our team that are gluten-free, um, that are vegetarian, that have celiacs. And so, you know, regardless of your, you know, your dietary uh, restrictions, there's ways to absolutely work around it and um, to still be fueling, you know, appropriately. But in general, beforehand, we're looking at carbohydrates, 
um, complex ca carbs. We're looking at simple, a balance of simple and complex carbs during, and then we're looking at glycogen restore and protein afterwards. Um, and then just to add a little bit, you know, a general uh, rule of thumb during a um, intense workout or an intense race would be one gram of carb per kilogram per hour. So if you're thinking how many carbohydrates should I be taking in over the course of this two hour marathon that I'm doing a hand cycle race for, think one gram per kilogram per hour um, is what our nutritionist at, at science and sport would tell us to do. Um, and then that has to be taken with a certain amount of fluids as well. Otherwise your body can't digest and absorb that. I'll, and I'll add to that, Eric, um, to both, you know, just from a high level, uh, train how you race and race how you train. Um, don't, you know, if you're going out and training and eating, you know, shot blocks or, uh, you know, gels, you know, during training, and then you decide you want to do a, a drink mix for your race, you know, there's, there is gut training. Um, there is getting your body used to that, especially if, you know, these more intense races, um, you can, you can mess your stomach up and, and ruin a race, trying something new first time in an event. Um, so I typically try to, when I'm doing hard workouts or, or hard training, I typically try to eat the way I would eat during a race. And during a race, I try to eat like I would when, when I'm training, um, again, just to make sure your stomach's used to it, your body's comfortable with what you're, you're putting in it. Um, and you're not, not surprising yourself there, uh, in a negative manner. Um, yeah. And then I typically just as another heads up on race days or for big training, uh, typically don't, you know, try to have that last meal, you know, about three hours, two to three hours before the event, um, give your time, your body time to digest it and, and, you know, turn that, that food into fuel prior to starting. Awesome. So some of the questions I received while we're having this online paracycling is a lot of these guys are riding bikes to lose weight. And they're asking me, I want to lose weight, but when I ride, I get too tired. So the feeling is very important for these guys, but some of these guys have really no knowledge of what they need to put in before they even work out. So that's been one of the questions I've been receiving a lot. But you guys answered it in a very simple way and also very elite level complex way. So I think that- well, well, I can add, I mean, I can actually specifically answer that question as, re as well. When you're working out and preparing for a workout, like you have to fuel your body. Don't, that is not the time to be cutting carbs and, and um, watching your intake. Like your body needs it in order to perform and the intensity and regularity at which you perform is how you will lose weight. It's that time in between workouts that, you know, you need to look at what you're intaking and with what frequency you're intaking it at. And then um, you can kind of period, periodize your uh, food intake as well. Meaning if you're eating larger volumes closer to your workout window, your body's going to utilize that energy more constructively than if you eat it right before you go to bed. Um, it is then going to think, all right, this guy's gonna try and hurt me tomorrow when we go and do this workout again. I'm storing all of that is fat, the best that I can, so I have these energy stores. So you need to think about what you're eating in proximity to your workouts, and then when you're not working out, that's when you need to watch it. But, you know, even when I'm on a restrictive diet, I tell myself when I'm on the bike, I can eat anything I want. Like I'll bring an Oreo with me. I'll stop and get an ice cream sometimes. And then it's when I get off the bike, as soon as I step off, that's when I start watching what I'm eating again. Awesome. And, and I'll add to it, you know, just perspective. And this goes a little off the diet, but, you know, in the, cause, you know, as a bike racer, I think we've all been there. Um, and when I, I mean, when I started racing, you know, it was the year I got out the Navy, I was 205 pounds, a uh, pack a day smoker. Um, I stopped smoking, kind of reined my diet in, but, you know, the big rule there, right, is low and slow. Um, 
you know, keeping your, your efforts in that zone two endurance area, um, you know, below tempo, that's when your, your body is trained to burn fat in those zones. Uh, when you go into those harder efforts and, and a lot of people think, right, I want to lose weight. I'm going to ride as hard as I can all the time. Um, but, but a lot of times your body's just burning sugars, uh, and, and, you know, you're, you're steering your body away from burning that fat and, and it can be kind of, it's not really a, an easy thought process, but it's, um, yeah, just low and slow and steady. And, and, you know, you, it'll be interesting. You, you go out and do a two hour endurance pace ride and eat like you should during the ride, you get off the bike an hour afterwards, you will be ravenous. You will be like more hungry than you've ever imagined. And it's kind of like, Oh, kind of eye opening. Yeah. And to Frank's point there, just the, the zone two, uh, an old coach of mine says, don't, uh, no, no offense to anybody French who might uh, be listening to the recording, but don't, don't ride like a French rider which means don't ride really hard up the hills and then coast down the hills, right? You're going to try to have the same power uphill as the same uh, power downhill, right? And so you're getting a more constant workout and um, the spikes in effort cause that uh, the sort of use of the glycogen and the sugars that Frank is talking about, right? So trying to keep it as even as possible for as long as possible will help with that. Awesome. I think that answers about it about that question so let me move on to the next question how do you know when you're drafting on rgt and what is drafting and what does drafting do i i like to i like to compare it um i think most people will get this but nascar right i think nascar is a, a really easy way to understand drafting because you see the cars working together the one getting real close up behind the other one um you know, the, I think the rule of thumb is at 20 miles an hour, uh, an upright bicycle gets 20% uh, power savings drafting on the wheel of, of the bicycle in front of them. So sitting right behind the rider uh, and letting that rider in front of you be in the wind and pushing that wind out of your way is the, the best way to describe that. Um, I'll let Eric describe what how, how to draft an RGT and what how, how to know you are. Yeah. <clears throat> so in RGT, there's the GUI, the basically the use, user interface. And in the upper left-hand corner is where you see um, all of the rider data that you're competing against. So the order of the riders that you're in the field with, uh, you can see your gap to those riders as well, distance and meters. And then you can see your, um, your numbers, your rider your personal numbers. So if your number is red, that means you're going too hard. You're going harder than what your effort should actually be to stay in the same position that you're currently in. You can actually back off. You want your number to be green. And then below um, your personal power numbers, you can also see uh, whether or not you're in the draft. There's like this, um, it looks like an energy bar basically that shows your proximity to the riders in front of you and whether or not you are benefiting from their draft or not. And so you want for that, um, that energy bar to be green and for that gap to be small. I believe the distance is 10 meters um, currently in the physics where you, if you're 10 meters behind a rider, you're no longer inside of their effective draft. Um, and you would need to do the exact same watts per kilogram or power output per body weight um, as they would in order to maintain your position relative to them. Great. Thanks for that answer. Next question is, how do you make my own training routes on RGT? So I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so the... Yeah, I, I got it. Um, so to make a training route in RGT, uh, the easiest way to do it is uh, you get a GPX file. Um, you can pull this from a power uh, a training file you have off of your head unit, your Garmin Wahoo, which uh, Brighton. Um, and then you can take that GPX file or you can create one in Strava or ride with GPS. Um, I think you can do it in Garmin now. Uh, 
take that GPX file and you email it to magicroads at rgt.com. Um, and uh, with the email address that your account is under, and it will automatically build out that road for you and add it to your Magic Road library. Um, the Magic Road will be named whatever the file name is. Um, and, and it'll be there. It takes maybe five to 15 minutes, depending on how big the road is. Um, I think the limit right now is 100 kilometers. Um, they will do one-off cases longer than that. Um, you can always email their customer support and they, they, they'll assist with that. Uh, there's also a Magic Road Facebook group for RGT and they have oodles upon oodles of Magic Road routes. I mean, everything from uh, spiral routes in space to routes on the moon to um, some of the best climbs in the entire world that you would never ever be able to get to. Um, so it's pretty cool and, and pretty fun to do. And there's a good FAQ about Magic Roads on the Wahoo RGT website as well um, that walks you through it with a YouTube video. Great. Thank you, Eric. Frank. Next question is, what is an ERG mode? Go ahead, Eric. Frank, you want to think? Um, so Frank, you're actually going to have to, I always get confused on what's ERG or not ERG. I believe ERG mode is when your trainer is controlling your resistance based on the terrain that you're riding on the platform. Nope. See, now I'm, I'm, I get confused whether I should turn on, so, or on or off. So this question is for me too. Thank you to whoever asked it. I will let you guys correct me and shame me if you would like. So ERG, ERG mode is when, um, say you build a workout or you import a workout from Training Peaks or FastCat or wherever you get your workouts from. Um, and this is for Zwift, or Wahoo RGT, any, any trainer road, any of them. Um, erg mode is when you build a workout and say you have a set power in there. So it's five minutes at 180 watts. Erg mode is the controller, the control, the smart trainer will maintain that power output regardless of how you're pedaling. So essentially it turns your brain off, right? You don't have to think about the workout. You don't have to think about your power output. The trainer does the thinking for you. And you, as long as you're pedaling your bike, it will go through that workout for you and do the power that that workout is saying you need to do. Uh, Kyle, I mean, does that, is that accurate? Yeah, I think it is. And I, I think the a nuance can be like, uh, that doesn't matter if you're pedaling at, um, 20 RPMs or at 100 RPMs, right? right. So uh, erg mode on, it can be really challenging until you sort of get up to speed and, and find your rhythm. So it's just something to understand if you're either changing powers, uh, you know, sort of power intervals, like uh, Frank was saying, or you're just getting used to it, right? You could be at like, you know, 90 RPMs feeling great at 150 watts. And then suddenly your interval for three minutes is at, you know, 250 watts and it's going to get slow and hard until you get up to to speed again, so something to consider there. I think I think there's always a debate back and forth about which one is better or is one better than the other, um, and I, I think that could be a, a a very long conversation. I personally don't use it that much, but I think a lot of people do, and they really love it. I I used to use it all the time for my workouts, and I found that it um it really uh, made the workouts easier, um, almost to a detriment. Uh, you know, it's, it, it gets rid of that mental toughness side of the workout, in my opinion, you know, if you're and that control, it, it doesn't, uh, by using the erg mode, again, you're letting the smart trainer do the thinking for you. And so you're not, it, there's a less finesse, I guess, with the workout, you're not the one like understanding how to control that power and, and be, be, uh, swap with it, I guess, like understanding just, okay, I know this is 200 Watts. Oh, 210. Okay. I got to back that off a little bit. Oh, 190. I got to put it up a little, you know, if you're in erg mode, it kind of, um, again, it, it does all that for you. Um, and, and to Kyle's point, 
there is a lot of quirkiness with it that you have to use it a handful of times before you understand like if you are going from a low power interval to a high power interval you have to like spin up that that trainer before it switches over to the interval or it'll bog down and you'll come to a standstill because you just can't turn the pedals over at that at that power at 20 rpm um so that's erg mode in a nutshell awesome thank you next question i have is how can i be on rgt at the same time listening to the live commentating that's on facebook do you need a multiple devices or is there an option to do all at the same time it's a good question. Um, you could be on Wahoo RGT and listening to um, the commentating, but being able to watch it on the same device requires full screen. So you'd have to have a dual screen setup, um, or you would need to have two different devices all together. Personally, my setup is to have a 4K Apple TV hooked up to my television. And that's what I run Wahoo RGT on and race with. And then I have um, a second phone. It's an old phone that I've kept from years past um, that I just you know throw on a little phone stand and put on a table next to me and have the live stream going um, while, I'm, while I'm racing. So that's how I get around it. Um, otherwise, I think you have to have a dual screen. There, there is a little loophole there that you can use. Um, it kind of takes away from the, the virtual experience. But um, if you have a, a, win, a Microsoft Windows computer, not a Mac, because I don't know how Macs work. Um, but you can hit the Windows icon uh, button and that'll bring up your menu on the bottom and you can pull up another tab or another app and, you know, pull up the live stream. So, you know, you can hit the Windows thing and then pull up Google Chrome and, and go to the live broadcast and have that overlaid on top of your RGT window. And RGT will still be playing in the background um, full screen. If you click back on the Wahoo RGT full screen though, that broadcast goes away and you have to hit the window icon again. Um, that's, that's how I get around it, but it does disrupt the screen. And so I, I recommend the, maybe not different devices, but at a minimum, uh, multiple displays. Okay. And that's a pretty good idea though, a loophole. <laughs> I use all right, it all the time when I'm just training. Yeah. <laughs> It's over experience, huh? Hmm. Well, I, my, my last question here is my power meter on a smart trainer seems much higher than when I'm riding on the road. How do I correct this? I can start yeah, uh, go ahead. if you'd like. Um, so first of all, Frank mentioned earlier uh, in this conversation that all power meters are off a little bit, right? Um, however, let's say if your um, FTP, to bring in uh, another topic of conversation, is uh, 150 watts, right? And you get on the trainer and it is 250 watts and you are just breathing easy and you know you can do it all day. Something's off, something's wrong, right? Um, and so there's there's calibration and spin down. Um, and it, so it depends on what apps you're using. It depends on what smart trainers you're using. Um, I think RGT doesn't allow an in-app spin down, but there's some other platforms that do. Um, you pretty much need to use the application for your smart trainer that uh, came with it from the manufacturer at, at a baseline, um, go into uh, settings or tools and do a spin down. Usually uh, there, there's some nuance here. A, a lot of people like to ride it for, you know, uh, 10 or 15 minutes just to make sure uh, the, the mechanisms in the smart trainer are warmed up and then you do your spin down and that should calibrate it. Um, uh, sort of to the most recent um, zero offset that you can get. Now, when you should calibrate it are definitely those times where you feel there's a major difference here at 250 watts where you should be at 150 watts. But also if you move the smart trainer, like you know you uh, are going to a buddy's house and, and uh, doing something, or if it's been a while, a few weeks uh, before you've done it, or maybe before a, a particular competition or race to make sure as accurate as possible, those are all good times um, to consider it. Um, does anybody else want to jump in in terms of um, specifics for um, the platforms we're using? 
Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, we, um, we partner with Saris on Project Echelon, um, the recommendations that they gave us. We used to actually do require calibration every day before, right before the race. Um, and they actually, they came back and said, no, that's a terrible idea because people tend to calibrate erroneously, right? And the more you do it, the more chance you have of screwing it up and, and getting a, a negative calibration or a bad calibration. Um, their recommendation was spin easy on the trainer or hard on the trainer, just ride the trainer for 10 to 15 minutes, get it nice and warmed up, and then do the spin down with the uh, manufacturer's app. Um, all the apps do it, uh, Wahoo, Saris, Ruby, um, and, and it's a pretty quick process. It takes all of two minutes to do, and it's pretty self-explanatory. It's spin it up to 20 miles an hour and then stop pedaling and let it coast down. Um, so that's, that's the recommendation I would use. Uh, I've tried using third party apps to spin down, um, and I actually had my fiance get kind of mad at me because I screwed her trainer up doing that and I had to go back and recalibrate it. Um, so yeah, I, I recommend manufacturer's app and just uh, ride it for 10 to 15 minutes and then um, use the, the app to do the spin down. And then to, to Kyle's point, yeah, anytime you change the um, atmospheric conditions that the trainer is in, barometric pressure, big temperature swings, um, and then, you know, the, the recommendation from SARS was, you know, may probably just do it monthly, um, you know, first a month or whatever, just to keep it in practice and make sure it's accurate. So everybody needs to do a spin down when they first get their smart trainer. Yeah. Go ahead, Eric. So um, I think for maybe a, a more untrained athlete, somebody who doesn't understand as well what Kyle was saying earlier about consistent pressure on the pedals, regardless of the terrain and the situation, uh, meaning like crosswind, headwind, tailwind. Um, a lot of people, you know, when I've you know taught spin classes and things like that, their performance is more consistent and better numbers wise on a trainer than it is on the road. And it's just because the variables are controlled um, and their only focus is pedaling, right? Um, and when you put all those other variables into play, it you know it just becomes more difficult to be consistent in your effort. And so, if it's not that drastic difference, if you know you're ten percent better on the trainer than you are outdoors, um, you know, that that might actually be a reality. Is just that you're more efficient. Um, you're more consistent with your power output and the way you're using your energy on a trainer than you are outdoors because there's less variables at play for you. Also, I, I, might think... men... oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I might mention like if you're pressed for time and you're um, training for, you know, like uh, a, a new race, you know, a grand fondo you're trying to do or your first time to go 30 miles or 40 miles with buddies and you're pressed for time, like, the trainer can be a really good way to do that, right? Um, it's, you know, an hour on the trainer um, is going to be much more effective than an hour outside when you're having to stop at stoplights and you're coasting down hills and all that other kind of stuff. So just kind of basic um, thought process of trainer versus real world riding. That that kind of gets flipped on its head when you're starting to talk about racing and pack dynamics and, uh, you know, spending time face-to-face -face with your friends or our fellow veterans. I think those are all really awesome things to do face-to-face. -face. But if you're pressed for time, uh, the trainer can be great. I, uh, I've never been more fit than I was during COVID because I was doing 15 to 20 hour weeks on the trainer every week for six to eight months. Um, but I was a terrible bike racer after that six to eight months, just because, uh, bumping shoulders and, and just, yeah, pack dynamics and tactics go out the window when you're, um, for the most part, well, in real life tactics go out the window when you're, you're racing virtually. It's a, a different discipline. Definitely. That's a good point too. The, what Eric mentioned for me is completely opposite. My power outage on the trainer is a little bit lower than when I'm outside. Maybe because my train over here is a little bit easier. Maybe I'm riding on downhill. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I, I think it's, 
Eric, you're not. Yeah, uh, you you didn't say anything. <laughs> On a delay, but I said, or he's an absolute animal. You never know. Yeah, I I find that uh, your power output is higher, or you're more comfortable, whichever one you're riding more often, right? If you ride outside a lot you're gonna be more comfortable and you're gonna do better outside. If you ride indoors a lot, um, you're gonna most likely be better indoors. Um, I mean, I, I say during COVID, I rode every day, you know, for eight months inside um, and I was terrible outside. Well, then once COVID ended and we were racing outside again, I was training with friends and doing group rides. Um, I tried to get on the, I used to do a hundred mile, four and a half hour ride every Saturday morning on, on the trainer. And, um, I get on the trainer now and 90 minutes kills me. I just, I can't, I, it, 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 I struggle to, to get it done. Great. Well, that is all the questions I have for this session. And thanks for submitting your questions, everybody. And thanks to Eric, Frank and Kyle for answering all your questions. And we are planning on having this periodically. So we will have another one coming up soon and we will keep you posted. And this is all we have for you for today. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Bjorn.